Well, to help us explore this issue further, I'm joined by Professor Richard Ladner from the University of Washington. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Now, a lot of the tech trends that we see in the general market can play a key role in making products and services more accessible for people with disabilities. So what are some of the key trends that we should be aware of? Well, I think one of the, the key trends is the mainstreaming of uh, you know, access technology. For example, years ago, there were screen readers for blind people uh, so that they could uh, view what's on the computer screen. Uh, they could listen to it as opposed to see it. And these things were like $1,000. And the, the new trend is that uh, companies like uh, Apple, Microsoft, and Google are building into their systems screen readers as is. So you don't have to buy this additional software uh, to make it possible. So I think the mainstreaming of you know, some assistive technologies or some access technologies seems to be a major trend. And as we just saw in our report earlier, Australia has initiatives like the Remarkable Accelerator to really help develop these startups to improve the quality of life. And you mentioned several companies. Now, what about some of the countries? Who's really leading the charge there? Well, I think uh, Europe and the United States uh, are the ones I'm most familiar with. But I hear things out of Brazil, out of Japan, uh, some really neat technology out of Japan for, for example, uh, doing optical character recognition of mathematics as opposed to just plain text. And that was developed so that blind people could uh, uh, have access to mathematics. Now, all this research and development obviously costs a lot of money, and there's a range of <coughs> subsectors, as you mentioned, span spanning mobility, vision, things like transportation, communication. So mm -hmm. when it comes to where this money is going, where is the majority of it being invested? Well, I, that's a good question. I wish I was a business person and I could answer that fully. Uh, but what I understand is you know, that it's a lot easier now to develop uh, technologies that uh, somebody who is a qualified or a skilled uh, software engineer can build some cool assistive technology for, for example, the iPad. And so the startup cost isn't that great. Uh, and then, of course, you have to you know, get it out there and inform people and so on. But uh, that can be done as well. You can go to conferences and uh, like the CSUN conference here in the United States where people demonstrate their different technologies and get the word out about them. So the cost isn't that great unless it's something like you mentioned earlier, like a, a very expensive wheelchair, uh, something that really does cost quite a bit of money. But I think the cost of these technologies is going down for development and for production. Now, a lot of these gadgets that come out just in everyday tech, obviously they're the very flashy ones or they're targeted to gamers. So how do you get more investment attracted into the accessibility range instead of just something for gamers or something just for leisure? Mm, that's a good question. And I think what I've seen in the past is that sometimes a technology that seems to be really good for people uh, with disabilities turns out to be a technology that's good for everyone. An example of that is optical character recognition. The early days of optical, op, optical character recognition was for blind people to read books. And lo and behold, now it's ubiquitous. Everybody uses it. Uh, another example is the, electronic, uh, the electric toothbrush that was originally designed for somebody who uh, couldn't brush their teeth as we normally did. And so the toothbrush sort of did it itself. And now all dentists around the world you know, recommend uh, these uh, electronic toothbrushes because they would do a better job. So I think uh, that there is some risk in going into a new technology, but there are byproducts. Just like when we went to the moon many years ago, there were many byproducts like the transistor. Now, as you mentioned, several of these inventions, and when it comes to actually developing them, it's understandably easier to fill the needs of people with disabilities if they're part of the conversation when it comes to developing it. So what role can startups make when it comes to getting more people with disabilities into entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's a good question. And of course, I'm a big believer of including people with disabilities in your workforce. And, and so when you have somebody with a disability that's part of the team, then you're more likely to develop something that people can use. And in, in fact, not only should be part of your team, but uh, in the development part, but also in the testing. And they don't have to be necessarily employees, but you have to have a good testing sort of workforce uh, that you can bring in and make sure that the thing you're building really is useful and not just for one person, for example. And just lastly, if you had to think of some of the biggest hurdles for people with disabilities when it comes to getting into the tech field, what would you say they are? Um, 
again, that's a really good question. I think the biggest barrier is attitudes, that, that people underestimate what a person with a disability can do. Uh, they don't think that they're capable, and quite often they're quite capable. And unfortunately, you know, this gets ingrained into the people, the people with disabilities' heads that they're not capable. So just sort of changing the mindset of the population, you know, you're talking about the one billion people in the world, and they're not just going to be lying around doing nothing, they can actually do a lot of contribution to make the world a better place. Well, thank you so much. We're going to have to leave it there. Professor Richard Ladner from the University of Washington.